welcome back to the Given Go. I'm your coach Reynoso with my boy. Soltero. What's up, y'all? We're going to be doing a combined 11 between Barcelona and Liverpool. We're going to look at both of their starting 11, or at least the crop of players that they both have, and decide which is the best option to go with in what is going to be a 4-3-3 formation. Okay? 4-3-3 formation, the best player in every position, some fun debates and selections to make for two of the most fun teams in Europe at this moment. Yeah, and when I was going through this, I I, uh, I really don't think there's any debate. No, not really. Yeah, I was <laughs> looking at what so, areas man. could we maybe, maybe in the midfield, I think there could be a player that maybe I prefer over yours, but I don't know. I'll have to anticipate, but... Yeah. Certain sectors of the pitch, I think, are pretty defined. So, man. So, let's start up top. The most exciting part of the pitch, offense. Let's look at the front line and who makes it through. And let me just start off please. in the right wing position. <laughs> please, please. <laughs> but we got my boy, Mo Salah, yeah. going up against Lamin Yamal. And it's crazy because if Yamal was matched up with basically any other wing in the world, I probably would have selected him. But it's unfortunate that he's up against, in my opinion, the Ballon d'Or front runner at this moment, and a Mo Salah that has looked as good as ever, scoring so many goals, showcasing that playmaking ability, and just proving to be a vital, important player for Liverpool that is carrying them offensively, honestly, because Gagpo, Luis Diaz, Nunez, they can shift in and out, but it's always Mo Salah in that right wing position, looking at the numbers, he has better numbers in La Mina Mall, and he has just as good of the impact and playmaking ability. For me, it's Mo Salah easily. Easily, man. I honestly don't have much to add here. I think this speaks for itself. It's Mo Salah over La Mina Mall. It is crazy, though, if you just consider the fact that it's, it's kind of close. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of close debate, and it's crazy because Yamal is 17. Yeah, bro. <laughs> like, imagine if it was like Saka. <laughs> right. That'd be, that'd be, that'd be tight. Be tight. That'd be tight. Bro. Who do you go with? But this one is clear. It is Mohamed Salah, the best winger right now in Europe. Uh, but I go. we go to the left side, and I mean, Liverpool got some crazy players. You've got Luis Diaz, you have Cody Gakpo in that position. Yeah. But uh, I also think this one's clear simply because Rafinha is one of the best attackers right now in the world at club and international yeah, level. He's yeah. just going off this year. Hansi Flick has figured out how to get the best out of him. He can cut inside. He can stay out on the wing. He's passing has seemingly gotten a lot better. He's so much more creative now in this world with Barcelona. But you give him a chance in front of goal, more often than not, he's going to put it away. Rafinha is one of the best attackers right now in Europe. So I would put Rafinha. Rafinha as my left side attacker. Easily. Yeah. No debate there either. I was looking at it. And because Gakpo and Luis Diaz do shift a lot, just kind of based off the opponent in their own form, Rafinha has been a staple for, yeah. for Barcelona. And the goals that he is scoring this year are just ridiculous, man. Like, he has ascended to a level that I didn't know he had in him. Based off of his Leeds United days, I remember I, I was questionable about him, especially last year when Barca went and got him and we kind of saw what I would consider a mediocre season from him. Yeah. The rise that we've had from him this year has been just so, so good. He's easy the starting left winger for us which then leaves us with the striker position which is also a position that I think is incredibly clear because ultimately for as great as Darwin Nunez is in that role or Diego Jota is in that role for Liverpool Jota has been injured and Nunez isn't the pure goal scorer that Barcelona has with Robert Lewandowski just being the, the Pichichi leader right now in La Liga and one of the best strikers in European football. Yeah, bro. 15 goals, I think it is, in 14 La Liga games. He's getting all the goals for Barcelona. He's been going completely off for, for Barca this season. You give him a chance, he's putting it away. Like, this one's clear, too. Lewandowski is seeing a bit of a renaissance for himself career-wise, and he just looks better than ever, honestly, mm -hmm. in front of goal. Give me Leva, number Easy. nine. And there we go. So we have Rafinha, Leva, and Salah up front. Let's go to the midfield positions where this should be a fun conversation. Yeah. This really should. I'm going to nominate Ryan Grafenberg. Mm -hmm. One of the most informed midfielders that we've seen this entire season. Similar to Rafinha, not having the best year last year, but then having an incredible rise this year that has made him one of the top midfielders in the world with his ball security, his IQ when he's on it, his retention of the ball, and then, and then also just how he smartly feeds all the offensive players to let them do what they're best at. Ryan Gravenberg, I think, has completely ascended into that role that Arne Slot has given him, and he's delivered every single game. I'm, I'm never disappointed with the performances I've seen from Gravenberg specifically, so I think he has to get into this midfield. Easy. 
Easy, bro. Ryan Gravenberg, I completely agree. He's getting into this midfield all day long. It's nuts, man. He's been almost flawless mm -hmm. for Liverpool. It's crazy to see. He's quickly becoming one of the best defensive midfielders in the game. Arnie Stott's getting the absolute best out of him. I'm picking Ryan Gravenberg all day long in that DM position for sure. For sure. So who gets in as well? Do, do any Barca players get into the midfield? I would nominate one Barca player to get into this midfield. Let's say his name at the same time. Okay. Okay. Uh, after right. three? After three. All, all right. right. Let me see. One, two, three. Pedri. Pedri. Okay. All right. Perfect. Thank God. Right. <laughs> there we go. I thought maybe Casado might have a shot here. Mm. But looking at it, I think it's pretty clear that there has to be two Liverpool midfielders and one Barca. Yes. No, I completely agree. Pedri, for me, is the only Barcelona midfielder that would get in to this Liverpool side right now. And he would easily get mm -hmm. in because he's so creative. We saw his performances at the Euros with Spain. And we've seen his performances with Barcelona this year. He's, he's fantastic, especially in that pocket position where he can just facilitate, contribute off the pass. He's so ridiculously creative and talented on the ball. Give me Pedri in kind of like a more creative creative attacking yeah, position. Man, I'm liking this. Pedri and Gravenberg midfield would be crazy. Yeah. Now the question is, who's their pairing midfielder if we are going with the Liverpool player? Because you have Alexis McAllister, who maybe hasn't had the same magical season he had last year, but has been very serviceable. Dominique Sobo sliding that attacking midfield mm -hmm. role too can be impactful as well. Curtis Jones. Yeah. I think Curtis Jones is the pick here. And I know immediately upon hearing that, if you're a Barca fan, you're going to be like, how, how is Curtis Jones getting picked <laughs> over the names that they have in their midfield? But you see the responsibility that's being asked of him, the task that's being asked of him from Arne Slot. Curtis Jones is actually delivering, bro. He's scoring goals. He's making critical passes. He's playing much smarter on the ball and knowing when to release it as well. And he's doing it against really, really tough teams in both the Prem and the Champions League. I think in this moment in time, it's Curtis Jones alongside Gravenberk and Pedri. Dude, yes, done. I told Thumbs you, up. there's going to be no contention here, man. I <laughs> completely up. agree. I have Curtis Jones as well as that third midfielder. His improvement from last year to this year is ridiculous, man. It's almost like Liverpool just have a new midfielder there. Mm -hmm. His reading of the game is fantastic. He's doing both ends of the game in that midfield almost perfectly. He's tracking back. He's box to box. But his involvement offensively is what's really standing out for me this year under Ane Slot because as you said he's making critical passes he's getting goals he's getting so involved offensively they just have a completely brand new player in Curtis Jones and when I compare him to Gavi Frankie de Jong Marc Casado specifically I just I would pick Jones all day long man de Jong's had weird injuries over this last 12 months he's still kind of getting back into it Jones for me is just way more influential when he's on the pitch compared to De Jong Gavi too has had some injury woes and he's still trying to just get back into the flow of things and I think overall Jones has a better engine than Gavi does so I think it is clear Jones has to be that midfielder what about Dani Olmo Dani Olmo, I would compare him to Pedri I say Pedri is better and yeah. then we pick Pedri so yeah. yeah yeah so we have two Liverpool players versus one in the midfield and then we have two Barca players versus one Liverpool player in the offense mm -hmm. when we look at defense can this go five for five Liverpool's way dude dude <laughs> I, I almost put it five for five it's almost I there almost did it there's one position it's that left back position where I would entertain Alejandro Balde simply because he's 21 years of age he's very much like Ryan Gravenberg, becoming probably one of the most exciting left backs in the world. When he's on his day, he's basically another winger. He's auxiliary in that sense where that left-hand side all of a sudden becomes very dangerous for opponents to have to deal with. If you consider it's Rafinha and Balde, he's ridiculously talented off the dribble. His pace is unreal. And when I compare him to Andy Robertson, it's just a little interesting because Robertson is now getting old. No, yeah, He's yeah, getting old. Yeah. And his offensive contributions are drastically decreasing. And it, it is just down to age. I think his reading of the game might be better than Balde's. But when you compare that physical oh, attribute, yeah. which is very important for yeah. fullbacks, I think Balde wins. Yeah. And if I had to pick, am I going Balde right now or Andy Robertson right now? This might be more down to preference as a coach, but I think I would pick Balde. I think yeah. I would. I, I think it's pretty pretty obviously Balde too. I really do yeah. because you ask a lot of Liverpool fans 
they're going to say that left back is one of the positions that needs to be addressed in the winter transfer window with the, you could call downfall of Andy Robertson. Not to say that he's been utter trash or anything. He's great, but he is a player that relies on his pace and his strength a lot. And he's kind of lost a lot in both of those departments. And it's shown so far. He can still hold his own in certain situations, but just not as reliable as it used to be. And so because of that, we've seen Simikas actually get minutes as well in that left back position. But because there's rotation there, it's like the it's like the Luis Diaz Gakpo situation. Balde is more reliable when it comes to the fullback position. I think he's the easy pick there. Looking at the center backs, it's tough to make an argument for Kubarsi when Konate and Van Dijk are playing up to this level. Best defense in the Prem, yeah. best defense in the UCL. Kubarsi has been immense, incredible, but just not not enough to get into this incredible duo of Van Dijk and Konate. Yeah, I won't accept any argument for any Barca <laughs> defender here. I, I just can't. Van Dijk yeah, and Konate are way too good right now. They have to be the starting center back. There's no be. question. So here. easy. Now we go over to the right back position where we've seen Trent Alexander Arnold start versus Jules Koundé, mm-hmm. which is this is a pretty Good discussion. This one's tight. Yeah, this one's tight. Because I'm looking at Trent and how he's performed this season, maybe not as offensively impactful as he was when he was under Klopp's system, but continuously as reliable. Um, Great. Has done a great job defensively. I think Arnie Slash turned him into a little bit more of a conservative fullback in terms of just how often he would go forward with Klopp's Liverpool. Now it's a little bit lesser, but still very smart approach that he has to the game. And Jules Koundé, I think, is one of the best ones in that position as well, bro. And such a key player, one of the best players for Barcelona. This one's really tight. I get thrown off, though, because just recently, Jules Koundé had an absolute howler of mistake, <laughs> right, man. Right, right. And I know if Trent did that, he would be getting, he would be getting trashed online. Yeah. So I'm leaning slightly Trent's way. But this is one I'm completely down to delegate if Kunde is who you end up wanting to go with. Yes, I see this one as pure preference as well. If you're a coach who wants pure defense, the obvious answer is to pick Kunde because he's basically just a third defender there. Where Kunde becomes elite in that right back position is he's comfortable going forward. He's not going to blow past any defender, but you give him the ball up the field in that right back position, he's going to know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a pretty decent passer. But he's a better defender than Trent. But if you're a coach that wants just maybe a little bit more versatility and mobility in that right back position, then you're clearly going to pick Trent Alexander-Arnold, who I actually think has had a bit of a resurgence this year under RNA slot. I agree. I think he's become a better defender, maybe not physically, but I think in the reading of the game, he knows when to track back and he's much more adept at seeing danger than I think he has been in the past. But you compare him to Koundé on the ball, Alexander might be a better crosser over the ball. He's probably a slightly better passer over the ball as well. So I think this comes down to preference. I would lean Trent and Alexander Arnold. Because ultimately he does play for the better defense. That that you too. Know? Yeah. I'm going Trent. I'm no. going Trent on this one, which leads us to the last position, goalkeeper, which is both interesting for both teams because the starting goalkeepers aren't here. <laughs> Alisson is out. Mike Ter Stegen is also out. And so instead we've seen Iñaki Peña hold down the fort for Barcelona and very well, I would say, for, for what's been asked of him. And then Kelleher doing the same for Liverpool. And I have to go Kelleher. Yeah. I have to go. The, the saves he is making, I think he has proven himself to be a top 10, maybe even top five keeper in the Prem. It's just ridiculous that he serves as a backup goalkeeper for Liverpool. Ridiculous what he's done so far and how he's just steadied the four. We haven't even felt the absence of Alisson, which is a crazy sentence to say. Crazy. Because Alisson at his best is is a top goalkeeper, one of the best ones in the entire world. So the fact that he can get injured and we don't feel that impact, I think it's all the credit to give to Kelleher. Whereas with Iñaki Peña, I just don't see him having as high of a ceiling as Kelleher does right now. I'm going Kelleher, bro. That's my boy. Yeah, Kelleher honestly could start anywhere in the world. If there was... Any team that just needed a new starting goalkeeper, he could go anywhere and immediately start. He's that talented. He's come up so big for Liverpool at the end of last season and already now with Alisson getting injured again. So yeah, I'm going Kelleher as well. But just for fun, let's say it's Alisson and Ter Stegen. Okay. Like, who would we pick here as well? Because, dude, what, what, what's crazy? Ter Stegen's insanely good shot stopper. Like, mm-hmm. you look at his stats... Over the last five seasons, comparing to Allison, dude, they're almost the exact same. So from like a technical perspective, 
you there, you could go either way. Ter Stegen or Allison, if you had to pick one to be your starting goalkeeper for 10 years, I don't think you could go wrong with either one. I don't think there would actually be any sort of downgrade. Mm. Um, now, Alisson has been a part of bigger moments. He's been a part of bigger teams. Whereas Ter Stegen has been a part of a very interesting Barca side who have gone through a lot of reformations over these last couple of years. Alisson was at, there at the peak of Liverpool in 2019, winning the Champions League, winning the Premier League, right? Alisson's also won the Yashin Trophy. So I do think it's clearly Alisson as the better goalkeeper. But just from a clearly technical perspective, it's literally neck and neck. I disagree. I think there is a difference. When it comes to Alisson, what I see him as a more better positive when it comes to comparison to Ter Stegen is he's always more in control. He's always more calm. You never see Alisson panic the way that you see Mark andre Ter Stegen do as well. And then I've also seen Ter Stegen make a lot of mistakes on the ball when he's on it and he's feeding the ball out to his defenders. Whereas Alisson rarely makes a mistake when he's possessing the ball and singing it out to whoever's up top. And also I see Alisson as having the potential of maybe even getting an assist the way he has with his the way he services the ball to most Hala up top or the way they can sling a ball his accuracy is really good so on the ball and then between the sticks I just think he's a better goalkeeper overall that maybe I don't know maybe doesn't have the same amount of saves that they're saying because he always does such a good job of just being in the right place at the right time his positioning is ridiculous when you look at Alisson and what he is best at whereas Ter Stegen I think does have a mistake in him every now and then I that, that's I think a little harsh on Ter Stegen, bro. Ask Barca fans, bro. They've been they've been asking for his head for, for the past like two years, man. I still think that's harsh because Ter Stegen's actually a really, really great. good shot stopper. I just I see him as like a bottom, I see him like as an eighth, ninth, tenth ranked goalkeeper in the world, whereas Addison I think is top three. And I think that difference is what what makes him an upgrade over Ter Stegen. Absolutely. I'm not saying Allison's the worst goalkeeper. Well, say, no, no, I, but I don't think they're neck and neck, personally. I think there's a difference. I think Allison is elite, like in that upper echelon, and they're saying it's just a level below. So I, I see this as a downgrade in the sense of, mm. you know, top clubs and who they could have between the sticks. I think Barca fans would take Allison if they had the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. I, I disagree, though. Ter Stegen's world-class. He's a world-class goalkeeper. <laughs> He's he class. Is. I don't know if I can put the word world right there. I don't I, know if I can do that. That, that, do that. That's crazy because he's been Barcelona's number one for how long? For sure. And Barca has been world-class for how long? One year. But that's that, that that's that's questioning their midfield and offense, right? Uh, I, 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 yeah, but for Ter sure. Stegen for sure. himself, performance-wise, Ter Stegen sure. has been the number one goalkeeper in Barcelona. There's been there's been no question. Yeah. I, I think I do. I would put Ter Stegen in world class. World class can you can have 10, 12 players in world for class. For sure, for I sure. I would put Ter Stegen definitely in world class. I, I think he's right there. I think he's right there. If you're world class, you got to be starting for your national team too. And I, I think Manuel Neuer represents kind of the idea of an elite goalkeeper and what Ter Stegen is, which is ultimately a really, really good class goalkeeper. You're always going to go with that better option. And I think I'm always going to go with Alisson when it comes to comparing him to Ter Stegen. International is interesting because it's Manuel Neuer, probably one of the greatest goalkeepers of all time. Yeah, you can't think, put that on But Ter I think Alisson is that too. I think Alisson is up, up to that level of greatness, which is why I see this as a downgrade. I don't see Ter Stegen in the same category as Echelon. I think Alisson is a top five goalkeeper I've ever seen. Yeah, I, I think if Ter Stegen played for Liverpool, he would have also won a Yashin Trophy because uh, of Liverpool's defense. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't think so because of the—I I think when it comes to certain aspects in goalkeeping, I don't think he has them all the way rounded out the way that Alisson does. Alisson's not asked to really pass the ball from the back, though. He's not asked to do it. Yeah, he is. No, no, not the He's same. Asked, way, not yeah. the same way that Barcelona asked their goalkeepers to do it. Alisson's mainly just asked to shot stop, and he's elite at yeah. it. But I mean, you compare Alisson's style of play to other goalkeepers; it's drastically different. Alisson's definitely more old school than anything else, bro. That that, that too, but he's I, way, I, way I'm more 100% old school. More confident that if Alisson played between the sticks for Barcelona and made the same type of role that Ter Stegen has right now, Alisson would be so much better at it. I think completely, he wouldn't have the same mistakes in him too. But then I think, where do you put Kelleher then? You put him better than Ter Stegen immediately? Well, I put him at ba almost at the same level. Because I, I just said, I, I said uh, Kelleher is a top five goalkeeper in the Prem right now. Yeah. I think Ter Stegen would be that as well. So I put him at the very same level. He's not world class in my opinion, but he's a class goalkeeper. I think he's world class because of his tenure. He's been so good for so long. That's not, I think that for matters, sure. I'll give that bro. credit. I'll give that credit. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, yeah, I think that's why I put him at that high of a level. I feel like I'm not, I'm not talking down on him, I'm giving him credit, yeah. but I'm not going to give him elite status, bro. I'm not. 
I think that's reserved for like the Courtois of the world, the Ali sons. I would say Oblak's a better goalkeeper than than Ter Sagan. barely, but he is better. And I, I just I think my, Ter Sagan's just slightly below that. If if if, if Oblak's world class, so is Ter Stegen then. Because because <laughs> Oblak's not asked to do anything other than shots. For sure, no, he's for not sure. asked to for do sure. anything in that aspect, else. Yeah, in that aspect, yeah. Um, but I, I, I think I just have a more reliable take when it comes to Oblak specifically and Ter Stegen. But that could be because I've just seen uh, Ter Stegen play more with the ball than Oblak specifically. So I'm down to entertain that when it comes to Oblak, Ter Stegen. I, I just see a clear difference with Alisson. That's fair. That's fair. That's yeah. fair. Folks, let us know who is your combined 11 for Liverpool and Barcelona. We got some fun combined 11s here. I think it's pretty clear. I think it's pretty clear when it yeah. comes to both these teams, but let us know down below if you disagree with any of our positions in the midfield, forward positions, or defenses. And we'll catch you guys next time for another Combined 11.